This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Roots and All, where my guest is Catherine Conway Payne. Catherine is the course director of the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh's Diploma in Herbology and an expert on the history of natural remedies. Catherine recently authored possibly the most beautiful book ever, a book called Herbology, a Physic Garden Pharmacy, where she looks at the origins of the Physic Garden at RBGE in the mid-17th century. She recreates and reimagines original recipes from that time, mentioning in the book the historical uses of such ingredients as powdered toads and spider's webs, but thankfully provides alternatives to those who want to look at growing their own medicine and herbal remedies nowadays. Catherine begins by telling us about her journey into herbology. My background actually originally was one of art and design and I came to Edinburgh as a student of Edinburgh College of Art where I studied actually theatre costume and fine art embroidery but my work always had a botanical infused kind of theme to it. I was very interested in Art Nouveau and natural forms and so plants were always a sort of um, inspirational source and objects from nature. So I think I was always drawn to that that side of things. And that could well explain the book, which I have to say, when I got it through the post, I think it is one of the most beautiful books I've ever seen. It's just gorgeous. So I don't know how much input you had in the design of it, but that could explain a lot. And could you tell me about the book Herbology? First of all, thank you so much. That's such a lovely thing to hear someone say. And And actually, I was involved in the design side of it quite a lot, along with Caroline Muir, who is the publications designer. We work very closely together. Um, But Kate um, Zoltan, the photographer, and I had so much fun working on the photographs. And I was actually staging the photographs with Kate. But that may be another element of this that we can come back to. So the book itself is uh, basically a celebration of the herbology programs that we've run at the Botanics Gardens now for nearly 20 years. And um, it's a compilation of some of our favourite herbal remedies that we make as part of a subject of study, which we call Green Pharmacy. Um, Green pharmacy and physic garden horticulture are kind of the key topics of study that we have in our more formalised programmes of study at the Botanics, so the Certificate in Herbology and the Diploma in Herbology. But primarily, we wanted to create something that originally was intended to be a part of the 2020 350th anniversary celebrations of the garden Um, and of course it all kind of got caught up in everything that transpired in 2020 and it was back burned for a while and so we we had to leave it and then when we revisited it we were able to resume the writing and the design and everything so it's been a, a labor of love over several years but it pulls together many really important threads that sort of run through our herbology programs at the botanics currently, a lot of which is informed from the rich heritage that the garden has and its origins as a physic garden in 1670. Yeah, I mean, and it is exactly that. It is a celebration and it does talk about the history. And in that vein, I wondered if you could explain what the Materia Medica are. Materia Medica basically translates as the materials of medicine. It's another word for ingredients, effectively, in herbal remedy formulations. We're so blessed at the Botanic Gardens to have such a rich source of these. The living collections at the Botanics comprises hundreds and hundreds of plants from all over the world. And whilst we're not obviously (laughs) raiding the living collections all the time for our materia medica, our ingredients of medicine making, it so inspires what we do. So I can give you a little example of that. We have a wonderful little tree. (laughs) I always think of it as a sapling, but over the years it's growing quite big. And it's the gum Arabic tree from sub-Saharan Africa, the Acacia Senegal. And we don't tap into this tree literally to, to extract its lovely sort of gummy exudates, but gum from the Arabian Peninsula is brought in from other trees that we utilise then in making things like our our herbal lozenges. And it's such a wonderful thing to work with. It's really magical. It looks like lumps of crystallised amber. 
and it's a gum. So basically lots of little sugar molecules and we dissolve this in water to make lozenges of it. So that's just one example, but there's so many. And in the glass house collections as well, where we have things like the bitter oranges and all sorts of cocoa bean tree, you know, and we reference all of these things. And then we have the area out in the garden where we're actually growing the Materia Medica. So these are our botanicals, medicinal herbs. And we sometimes forage a little too, very conscientiously, but there's a corner, a wild little corner of the botanics, which visitors to the garden may know, and we call it the wild woods, and it's the northwest corner of the garden. And we go in there, it's native woodland, and in the springtime, it's just like a, a sea of wild garlic and all sorts of other little woodland understory, lovely spring greens, lots of nettles and dandelions and things that we can utilize to make our spring herb puddings and vernal vinegars and all of the things, recipes that are included in the book. So long answer to a very lovely question of what is the Materia Magic? It's ingredients. Yeah, and I really like the book because, you know, people might assume that you're going to focus on leaves, flowers, fruit, but also you, you do talk about things like resin and mushrooms. So it's the whole of the garden becomes part of what you do, which is you know a lovely way of looking at it. Yeah, and even beyond the garden, you know, because we include seaweeds as well, which obviously, you know, so just sort of um, travelling out to lovely coastline along East Lothian is as a really beautiful component of our diploma and and certificate programs just to botanize and appreciate the botanicals out in the field as much as anything but yeah it's uh the garden just so connects you to the natural world and that's why it's such an extraordinary place to be able to visit but also to come and to study a subject like herbology yeah i have to say i've been on the website and i'm like oh god i'd love to be able to sign up to one of the courses they look amazing but the other sort of term that i've not come across before and i wondered if you could just explain that is that what is a vulnerary herb yes the best questions a vulnerary herb is a, basically a wound healing herb so any botanical that can be applied topically and internally actually to help heal damaged tissue surfaces so a really nice example is comfrey, which you could almost think of that like an emperor vulnerary herb, and it's fantastic for healing so many wounds. Um, it used to be used a lot more internally, actually, than it is nowadays, but now it's especially used for when they're slow to heal wounds, and it, it can be used in the form of poultices or paste or made into ointments and balms and creams, but there are so many vulnerabilities. There are herbs that actually the name, the common name, actually suggests that they are a vulnerary, like herbs like woundwort and bloodwort, which is actually St. John's wort by another name. But a lot of the old herbs were so much more appreciated than they are perhaps nowadays for their wound healing capacity because it was so important in the olden days that the wounds were healed well, so they didn't become really infected and maybe lead to blood poisoning and then death you know, which a simple wound could in the olden days really lead to that quite quickly and easily if they if they weren't well treated. So a very important group of healing botanicals, the wound healing or vulnerary herbs. It includes things like daisy as well, just the common little lawn daisy or bruisewort. That's one of its other English arnica sometimes referred to, or bruisewort. And you can literally um, steep that into lovely translucent oils, translucent oils and then get an extraction of the oil of the constituents into the oil and then solidify that with a little melted beeswax, make a lovely bruise work balm for bruises, as the name suggests. I think what the book does is makes you think about your wider landscape and the plants that you may not have considered before, such as something as humble as a daisy. But it also connects you to the seasons as well, I think. It makes you think about seasons and, and even the time of day. I mean, for example, you've got lunar infusions in the book, which I've never even considered, I've never heard of. You know, what are those? Oh, lunar infusions, what a fantastic thing to actually practice. I think an appreciation of the influences of the moon and other celestial bodies, the planets, the stars, has been appreciated since ancient times. I mean, our forefathers embraced all of this, particularly in close associations with nurturing of, of botanicals and the crops and all of these things. But the coming and going of the seasons and the calendar year, particularly the growing calendar year, was so pivotal and the gathering of the crops and the harvest and everything. 
So lunar infusions really sort of hark me back to those ancient practices. Although now in temporary times, um, gardening by the phases of the moon or moon gardening, lunar gardening is referred to also very popular. So a lunar infusion is the nocturnal, I guess, equivalent of what a solar infusion would be. So it's, it's basically allowing a botanical to infuse the light of the moon and the properties of the botanical have a chance overnight to basically be imparted into an aqueous extract. And it's capturing much more of an etheric kind of healing power and medicine in there. But certainly certain aqueous and water-soluble constituents will be captured into the water. But they're very sort of spiritous formulations. And there's something truly magical. And I don't use that word lightly. Anyone who's practiced a lunar infusion would really appreciate this. Your mind, body and soul are just captivated and, and captured into the moment of doing a lunar infusion there's nothing quite like it actually literally being outside in a garden at night and infusing botanicals especially some of the night blooming flowers into a little aqueous extract i could hear from speaking to you and from reading the book you're very passionate about all the plants that you work with and I don't think this is going to be a very easy question for you to answer. And when I ask this question, people go, oh, no. <laughs> but, you know, I wondered if you could possibly pick out some of your favourite plants from the book to work with. Goodness, yeah, I, I can. <laughs> um, it is a challenging question because oh, there are so many and it actually does change seasonally. Every time the season comes, you get so excited about the potential of, of the medicines you can make and the lovely botanicals you can encounter again. And then as that season fades, you lament its passing and they all oh, know they're all gone now for another year. And then, and then oh, but it's next season, you get all hyped up again. But off the top of my head and kind of right now, I mean, the things I've been really loving, just obviously passed them a while ago now, but the, the late summer, very early autumn elderberries were just dripping like jewels off the trees this year. I've never known a season like it, the elderberries. And similarly, we we absolutely love the sea buckthorns that we gather along the coastlines of East Lothian. There's the gum Arabic as well, which I mentioned to you, just because it's such a pleasure to work with and to watch this thing that looks so like these little gemstones just dissolving into rose water or to make lozenges out of. And then the witch hazels, which we have to look forward to, particularly the winter blooming witch hazels, which are Hamamelis mollis. And we have some of these in the garden but people may know these, that they get like these tangly little knots of flowers on them in sort of late January through into February. They look like little clumps of saffron and they perfume the air with the most incredible fragrance. It's quite sort of antiseptic, but very refreshing and cleansing. And it's just so lovely to see these. And we have a remedy that we make as a kind of reference to this. Um, we're using actually a, a witch hazel distillate, you know, witch hazel water, which can be readily purchased from, from pharmacies. But we, we make this up into a, a, what we call winter bloom, frozen winter bloom cream. And it's basically just infused with lovely witch hazel distillate. And it's just a, the loveliest thing. But when we can wander out into the garden in the depths of winter, often it's sparkling with snow or it's really frosty and glistening under these blue skies. And you see these yellow flowers on just bare twigs. And it's quite, quite magical. Similar thing that one of the real treats of having been at the Botanic Gardens in the rainforest glass house is to see things like the, the cocoa bean tree, the cacao, theobroma cacao, and, and just to see the pods forming on the tree and then maybe be gifted one of the pods by the horticultural staff and breaking open the pod and finding all these little beans nestling inside. Think, oh my goodness, these are actual cocoa beans. And then learning about the story of chocolate making and, and then actually making some chocolates and it's so fantastic. And you learn about the the cultural significance of these botanicals and their the ethnomedical applications of them from all around the world and how different indigenous peoples would make their medicines. Other other people's healing traditions, it's just so precious and valuable. As I say, it does sound like an amazing place to spend time in the garden. And I was reading a bit and I think that another thing that I liked about it, there were many things, but a lot of the stuff that you put in there is actually fairly easy to follow. And I think some people think, you know, oh, to make these remedies, I'm going to need loads of ingredients or loads of equipment. But I don't think that's necessarily the case. So if somebody hadn't done this before, what would be an easy thing for them to start with? Well, you know what, making one of the endurance or the balms is really a really nice thing to do. 
perhaps choosing one of the voluntary herbs which we already mentioned like the comfrey or the daisy or something like yarrow or so many others calendula maybe you can steep these botanicals in an oil like an almond oil translucent almond oil is very nice to work with or even just lovely sunflower oil so something very inexpensive but just a lovely uh, plant-based vegetable oil or seed oil and you can steep these botanicals in the oil. You can put them in, into a bain-marie, which means that the oil is heated very slowly in a little pot that's itself placed in water. And you warm the oil through and let it warm through for about 20 minutes. It's all described in the book. You don't have to let the water boil around this little pot, but you can just have it just sort of gently diff heat diffusing through it from the warm water that's all around it. And then you carefully lift the pot out of the bain-marie and you can strain out the herb and then put it back into the bain-marie and you add in a little, little bit of beeswax and melt that in. And that will create a, a very simple balm and you add a few drops of essential oil and that's a really lovely thing to do. Chamomile is another lovely botanical you can use in this way. And that gives you a really nice little topical ointment you can just apply locally to the skin. It's such a pleasurable thing to make. And such a lovely thing to use but you know some of the simplest things can also just be herbal infusions and they don't have to be boring a little herbal tea can be a wonderful thing to put together just creating a blend of different botanicals from a garden or an allotment or that you maybe just um, very carefully wild forage a small handful of things and you just want to to try them once you're absolutely sure you've got the a correct identification on them that's the most important thing always and that they're appropriate for the purpose but a little herbal tea and infusion is a lovely thing to make and equally so like a nighttime beverage just diffusing these things into warm milk again chamomile milk it would be a really nice thing for people to try at home or another nice sort of relaxing little herb that you could try just decocting into warm milk. And that needn't be a dairy milk. It could be an oat milk, or soy milk, or a nut milk of your choice, you know. So there's all sorts of things you can do that are really, really simple, but create actually quite powerful healing formulations that you can enjoy at home. Syrups are good too, actually. You can best to find the recipes for those in the book as well, but it's really nice to make like a fruit syrup. Or if you're wanting something a little bit more punchy, one of the alcoholic liqueurs as well, which is just the next step up from that, really. Yeah, there's so much to try and experiment with. But when you were talking then, it made me think some of the recipes take time or they may take at various stages of preparation. And I wondered if even on perhaps a kind of subconscious level, do these things sometimes have more potency or efficacy if there has been a lot of work that's gone into producing them? Gosh, that is such a good question. Absolutely, I would say yes. And it's something that we encourage, like particularly like with our, say, diploma and herbology groups, encouraging people to really take the time over the remedy making because that is such an intrinsic part of it and the therapeutic effect that that can actually have on the medicine maker themselves whoever that is whoever you are making herbal remedy even it's just blending a few little things to make a tea and um, i had someone from our diploma group just the other week asking whether or not it was all right to just blitz something up i think we were working with some hard woody material and i was encouraging them to grind it you know in a pestle and mortar the gristing and grinding of the pestle and mortar is really satisfying and i said could we just like put this in a coffee grinder and blitz it and of course you can but then you're taking out all of that investment of your yourself and your energy and your love and your creativity into the making of of this remedy and the fact that it actually slows the pace of life just for a moment and you're contemplating what you're doing, hopefully, perhaps not at first, perhaps your thoughts are all over the place and you're thinking about work or some difficult little scenario you're trying to resolve, you know, just day to day life. But suddenly you realise actually that a bit like when you're gardening, your thoughts, of you're allowed to flow and just unfold and unravel. And it's so, so therapeutic. It's this contemplative place that remedy making can take you to. Like imagine when you're just stirring something really slowly um, and, you know, you just lost a little bit in the moment. Something just bubbling gently on the hob and you're watching a lovely syrup slowly thicken and form. And in, in times past, they they used to actually have all sorts of 
little ritualized um, prayers and even singing and, and chants, which would be recited at these times, little invocations around the medicine making. It was all part and parcel of the ritual and magic of it, I suppose. And a lot of that, so much of that has now been lost. But allowing your thoughts just to, to flow and giving your time to relax and actually enjoy the creative process of making something um, which could just be for you or for friends and family. It's an indulgent thing to do. And we don't afford ourselves, I think, sufficient time in life for, for those sort of pastimes anymore. Yeah, that's a really lovely way of putting it. And I think, you know, we have that built into us from childhood because I think so many kids go around the garden and pick petals and make potions. And it's just within us to want to do that, to kind of work with nature in that way, I think. So you've mentioned the course and obviously you have the book. If people did want to find out more, where would they go? The Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh has a fantastic website and it, it tells you everything that's going on in the garden, all the lovely events, happenings and, and the education programme, which is expansive, is all listed there. And you just have to click on learn on the RBG website where it says learn. <laughs> and that will take you right into what's happening with all the courses. You just have to look out for herbology amongst all of that. And it, it will tell you the courses that you can study from the short courses which include evening class programs and maybe weekend Saturday workshops, things like that, right through to our more formalised programs, which are the Certificate in Herbology, which is a, a weekend programme which runs over five consecutive weekends, or one of our diplomas. So we have an online blended learning diploma, which you can study you pretty much from wherever you are in the world, or if you're living quite far away from Edinburgh and just can't make it in person, or there's a, a weekly one day course for the diploma as well, which is lovely. And then we have small groups that come in once a week and they are actually they have a dedicated herbology room, a classroom to study in, and they get their own herb bed plot to grow the medicinal botanicals out actually in the garden space, which is so fantastic. Thank you very much to Catherine. If you like this interview, don't forget to check out my episodes on herbalism with Barbara Wilkinson of the Herb Society and the episode on magical plants and flowers links to which are in the show notes. Thanks to you for listening. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.